So you came via that or you came via. So now there is a post already I added in the IIT Delhi seminar group, which should be on your phone, which has the October 22 link. If you click on that link, you will become member of the October 22 group, which will start on 1st of October. And on 30th of November, the group will finish. At that time, you will receive links to the 40 regional groups worldwide, and whichever, of course, you will all add the Delhi. So that's the way to connect. Now for IIT alumni, those who, of you who have come here, Sanjeev will send you this link. And then Sanjeev is coming. He will post that link into, and uh, you should get it by uh, Monday and you will be able to join. So I think that connectivity part. And then as uh, Sunil said, uh, if you want to help us in our uh, NGO activities, uh, please reach out to Sunil or, or Anju. Anju, please stand up. Anju uh, Kalhan, and she will take the name. This all has been arranged by Anju and, and Sanjeev. Uh, Sanjeev is from IIT. Delhi and they both have worked hard to make this happen. And thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we will, uh, we have discussed the introduction and covered some of the subject matter. In this second session, we will focus on five pillars of health. And, and, and these are the five things which are important uh, for uh, living a healthy life. Uh, so the f first of these uh, is food. So we will focus on food. Second is uh, detoxification, and I have talked about prana and apana. Prana is the food that is necessary. Apana, getting rid of the toxins, the waste. Third is circadian rhythm. Third, circadian rhythm is a concept that you, we all mammals on Earth, have evolved in 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night light or night time, and. Uh, it plays an important role. Our body has evolved that way. So our body releases certain hormones at different times of the day. And it's important that our clock is aligned with it. And we'll cover that. Physical activity is important. So let's go one by one. Food we'll spend. I'll go through some slides very quickly, which are basic slides. Um, you all probably know about it, but uh, let's, let's see. Oh, so basic, basics of physiology. We have 30 trillion cells which are our own, and we have 38 trillion cells which are of foreign organisms, bacteria, <coughs> fungi, and viruses. And they play a very important role. We learned about that only in the last 10 years. I showed you the Time magazine's uh, cover page. Um, I talked about prana and apana. Now, we have a gastrointestinal tract from our mouth to the rear end. And this is how we consume food. So, so that plays an important role. In this GI tract, the lining of this tract, you know, in some sense, this is really outside the body. It's like a rubber pipe floating in the water. The inside of the pipe is inside where the air is. If you sit in the pipe, you're not inside the pipe. You're still outside the pipe. So the GI tract, in some sense, is outside the pipe. Only when that nutrition gets absorbed and goes into the blood, it becomes inside our body. Okay. So GI tract is a passageway of digestive system that leads from mouth to anus. And, uh, it includes mouth, esophagus, this is the tube, the stomach, in the small intestine, and colon. Colon is where bulk of those foreign bacteria are residing. And the internal lining is made of epithelial cell. Now this is an important part to understand. And this is your picture of a GI tract from your mouth. This is esophagus, this is your stomach, and then these are small intestine, colon, and then rectum. Okay. This is digestive system. Again, your, your body begins to release um, uh, body fluids in the mouth for digestion purposes. So, so, so that uh, uh, the saliva is very important. That when you get up in the morning, so one of the things we tell is 
you should drink two glasses of warm water before you brush your teeth. It is called white gold, so, so that saliva in your mouth should not be thrown out with a toothbrush or paste, you should swallow it, it's good for you, okay? Uh, all right, so I'll go through this quickly. This is your stomach. This is a valve, esophageal sphincter. This is muscles that don't let the food from the stomach come back up, okay? And this is a valve, pyloric sphincter, where the food, once it is digested, goes into a small intestine, and it gets <laughs> absorbed in this intestine, okay? And then from here, it goes directly to your liver. So this uh, acid reflex problem is that these, these muscles have become weaker. When these muscles become weak, sometimes when you burp, these acid climbs up and you feel katidakare, we call it, or acidity. This is the cause of acidity. Acidity is caused because you are drinking too hot a tea or too hot beverages, okay? That is the cause of acidity, and or if you're eating very highly acidic diet, so so all fats are as nothing but acid. We don't think of them as acid, but they are all acid. Okay, all the cream and oil, and they all are nothing but fat. That's why we call them fatty acids. Okay, so that's the cause of the problem: drinking hot tea and and drinking a lot of oils and things like that. Okay, now this is. The, this is your colon, at your colon, this is a skin, and this is a, what is the epithelial layer. These are the, these are tight junctions, they are very tight, that's why they are shown rectangular, okay. They are very tight junctions, correct, because food should not go through them. Food should get digested, go to the liver, and then liver should send it to the rest of the body. Now, when you eat, so when you when we found out that we have these uh, millions of uh, these are all those bacteria, okay? These are which are residing in our colon, okay? Now these bacteria need food; they need to live too. There are 38 trillion of them, so they feed on fiber. So when you eat apple, the fiber of apple goes down and feeds these bacteria. They love it. So when you eat rajma, there's a concept called resistant starch. <clears throat> and rajma is the best example of chole or dal. So all the starch in rajma does not get digested in your stomach. Maybe <coughs> half gets digested, the other half goes to your colon and all these microorganisms feed on it and they love it, that's how they survive, okay? So when you are eating food, just like dairy, dairy has no fiber, eggs have no fiber, meat has no fiber, fish has no fiber. So if you are eating that kind of food, mostly as Americans do, then these fiber, these uh, organisms, they start eating this mucus layer because mucus layer is made of protein. We call it mucosal layer, mucus layer. Whole your body has epithelial cells are first covered with the mucus layer, and that is what this. So these are the epithelia. They are in the form of these fingers because to increase the surface area to absorb. Instead of straight surface, they're not straight surface. Like you have shag carpet. In the shag carpet, the fibers are coming out. Dari is flat, Dari is woven, Dari is absolutely flat, but the wall to wall carpet, they have threads which are coming out. Even Persian carpet, they are a lot of thread, they are very tight, so they call them how many knots per inch, you know? thousand knots per inch, those are very expensive carpet because they all fibers are vertical, but when you walk on them, they feel like a flat surface. This is how our, our, our colon wall is made of, it's made like this. So when these bacteria don't get fiber, they eat this mucus layer and it creates certain breaches. It's a couple of hajata, so it's a breach. When that breach gets created, then the food can go through this tight junction into your blood. So, 
it is called the leaky gut syndrome or leaky gut disorder. This is your gut has become leaky. The food before getting digested has entered into your bloodstream. When it enters your bloodstream, your blood perceives it as a threat. Ye kya gaya? Blood is used to having amino acids because normally food will go from your stomach to intestine, from intestine gets absorbed into liver. Liver breaks down the protein into amino acids. So in blood, amino acids should be flowing, not any protein. Because your body will make the protein. It makes two million different proteins. If it goes to a nail, it will make nail protein. Goes to a hair, it will make a hair protein. You know, different protein. But if that, if that uh, milk protein has leaked through a, a breach and go, and this is where the blood comes, okay? The blood is circulating here, they're absorbing. Then body perceives it as a threat and it builds antibodies to kill it. <coughs> See, I, just, I must fight, this is some foreign attack has happened, let's, let's fight it. So it kills antibodies. Now it kills those proteins, but what happens is some of our body's proteins, some of those two million proteins in our body, have a similar structure to the protein that came in the milk or in the chicken or in the sausages you ate that day, which leaked. So there are 80 different autoimmune diseases. Arthritis is one of them. So if you're eating a food and that, that foreign protein that entered your body in composition is similar to the cartilage of your knees or your elbows or wrist, then that antibodies start attacking them. They think this is also a threat because the composition is very similar. So a lot of our problems are caused due to autoimmune disease, which is caused due to lack of fiber in our food, okay? Then other system we have is respiratory system. So through the respiratory system, we get the second ingredient, which is oxygen. So you need nutrients that come through GI tract, and then you need oxygen that comes through your lungs, okay? It, it does, uh, yeah, oxygen, it, it, it gets rid of carbon dioxide and, and absorbs oxygen, and then oxygen goes to every part of your body. It, it helps in breathing, sound protection, other things, but okay. So this is your respiratory system. You're breathing through your nose or through your mouth, comes in here into lungs. And these lungs composition is kind of like cauliflower. So you have a large, the stem of cauliflower from the base, only single stem, from that stem you get three or four stems, from that you get even tinier ones. That is how a cauliflower is. In the end you have a flower, the buds. So that the whole flower looks like that, but inside these are vessels. So so breathing system is like that. This is what you see, okay? This is at an enlarged level. So here is, your air is coming through here. This is the last branch of the cauliflower I'm talking about. After this branch, all you have is alveoli. These are alveoli. And the alveoli on the outer surface, inside this is the air, oxygen, and outside it is your blood. This is the dirty blood coming uh, from, from, from your, um, I mean, uh, this, is, this is the blood coming and it's becoming good with oxygen is going back into arteries, okay? So, sorry, it's coming from here, artery. And these are blood, uh, very, very tiny capillaries. So, they absorb oxygen, they put oxygen in a red blood cell and send it to the rest of the body. Now, if you are having a plaque built up, if you are eating unhealthy food, these begin to clog. Some of these are so tiny that only one red blood cell can go at a time. So if any clog develops, you open this, this whole area where you can exchange the oxygen reduces. It's a double remedy. If you live in Delhi, the inside this alveoli also you are having the pollution. So if it is, if it is let us say this much, 
I understand that's the 10 square centimeter. And if half of that is covered with the pollution, your lung capacity has become half. So your lung capacity is going down as well as your capacity of the blood to reach there is going down. And that is what leads to asthma and COPD and other problems. Okay. All right, the third system is blood circulation system we have. Okay, so we talked about lungs, we talked about how we get food. Now, once the food is digested, it goes to liver and liver feeds it to your blood circulatory system. We have 70,000 miles of blood vessels. 70,000 miles, you can go around the world twice. The Okay, so the internal lining is made of a single cell layer called an endothelial cell. So these are single cell layer, just like for the digestive system you had a single cell layer made of epithelial cell, in your blood circulation it is made of an endothelial cell. Together they form the largest organ in human body, the, together it is called endothelium and the surface of endothelium is about the size of eight tennis courts, huge. You can imagine. And every second, because we, we pump blood every second, pulse rate of 60. 60 per minute is once per second. So every second, is to think of eight tennis courts in which you are throwing fresh juice every second. The juice goes there, gets away, then again every second comes. So it is absorbing, you know, just imagine whatever in nutrients. That is how large it is. Now when you eat wrong food, these blood vessels get clogged. They develop plaque. They get damaged, which we call inflammation. When they get damaged inflammation, then the body comes and puts an ointment of cholesterol. So cholesterol is the ointment. When your baby or grandchild slips and bruises his knee, you take a, from a tube an ointment you apply on the knee, okay? So that is what body does. In the body, in your blood vessel, there's a scratch has happened because you ate an egg or a bacon or a sausage, inflammatory food, then the blood sends cholesterol and say, let's patch it up. That, that, is, the, that is what goes on, okay? So it's, <coughs> that's how the blood circulatory system works. Okay, this is the blood circulatory system. We don't need to dwell on it, you know, it goes to, it has to go to every part of the body, every part of the body, every cell it needs to get to. That's why it's 70,000 miles. Third is, for fourth is the lymphatic system. So you have provided the food to a cell. Now that cell, after eating the food, the cell needs to poop out the waste. I mean, we all need that. Every cell needs to poop it out. So the cells, whatever it poops out, the metabolic waste, we have a janitorial system which collects it. And that system is called lymphatic system. So these are four systems. Now in lymphatic system, to collect and remove metabolic waste from each cell throughout the body. Protect body from illness causing invaders. Maintain body fluid level. Blockages, diseases or infections can affect one's health. And that goes on. In lymphatic system does not have a pump. There's no heart. So blood circulation has a pump, lymphatic system does not have a pump. The only way it can move the fluid is when you walk. So this movement moves that waste back into blood to be removed. You remove it by going to the toilet or urinate or sweat. So there are lymph glands under your arms, a lymph gland which join your legs to your body. So the movement is very important, I want you to understand. People think of movement as building muscles. No, building muscles is not important. Your muscles will build. Whatever you, your activity is, your muscles will automatically build to that level. Movement is important for waste to be removed from your body. The biggest reason. Okay. And, and, and the beauty is that that movement is still works when you are stepping down. So if you have difficulty climbing up, you live on the fourth floor, just go down. Every time you take a step, the movement is happening. Okay. So this is the lymphatic system. You can uh, see uh, the cancer I had was in the lymphatic system in this area. Okay. 
it is started from testicle and moved up to the lymphatic nodes. So they can see they inject the dye on your feet and they say the dye is blocked here, that's where the cancer is. Okay, so human microbiome, I, we won't go into detail of it, but this is the foreign cells which are residing in our body, I told you, you know, which lead to the epigenet, epigenetics, which is different from person to person. Uh, okay, so we are going to talk about the five pillars of health. The first is food, and, and so what I recommend is that you eat plant-based whole food. It should be plant-based and it should be whole. Now why whole? Because our body has evolved eating whole food. When you eat sugar cane, your body says, yeah, I know sugar cane, I've been eating it for 100,000 years, I know what to do with it. When you eat sugar, body gets confused. And so this perceives it as a threat. Inflammation is body's response to a perceived threat. Whether it's a real threat or not doesn't matter. It perceives it as a threat. When it perceives it as a threat, it becomes in defensive mode. So one example I give is you live in let's say you live in Greater Kailash. You have a house or defense colony, whatever. It's not an apartment. My example works better. You have a house, you have a small lawn, you have a gate. And every morning when you get up, you see a sweeper sweeping the street. He doesn't bother you because he comes there every day. You see him. You say, oh, okay, he's doing his job. Then a newspaper man comes and he throws the newspaper or brings it. It doesn't bother you. You are familiar with him. You know he comes every day. Then your doorbell rings, a bai comes, and you know your bai comes to work at 7 o'clock every morning. You let her come in. Now suppose a, a foreigner from Africa has come and he's 6 feet 4, 350 pounds and it rings your doorbell. You get scared. Ye kon aagya? The wife says, Ki nahi, nahi, nahi kholna. Just pretend we are not home. Apne aap chala All kinds of responses. Not like you are feeling threatened. You are feeling some risk is there. Now he may be a very simple person, a new college graduate who came from Ghana. He just wanted to know, ki Kanaat place jane ke liye kaun si bas chahiye? Please bata dijiye. No, he may not be a real threat, but your body perceives it as a threat. We are not accustomed to him. So when we eat food which we were not accustomed to for millions of years, body perceives it as a threat. Now I told you body did not eat meat because meat was not tasty as I discussed earlier. So body always said, no, give me apple, don't give me this raw uh, egg. So animal food causes inflammation. I'm telling a simple way the body perceives it as a threat. And that inflammation causes problem in your blood vessels. So as an ointment, cholesterol comes and deposits it. You can just protect it. So it's the cholesterol is a defense mechanism. Following it? OK. Uh, so in, in this pillar, we say eat plant-based whole food. Don't eat animal food. Don't eat highly processed food. No refined food, no oil, no sugar. So you can have peanuts. Body has eaten peanuts for millions of years or whatever time. When peanuts come, say, to, achha hai. But you eat peanut oil, why say, ye gaya? Ye liquid kaan se gaya? I have never eaten it. Never meaning. See, if you write a book on your evolutionary cycle, a 500 page book, on the page number 500, in the last paragraph, they will write about last 10,000 years. When we domesticated and settled down. Before that, we were not. We were traveling along the water from one country to another, one forest to another. You lived in one area for a month, all the fruits are finished, you walk 25 miles, and you put your data there because they have fresh supply of fruits and vegetables. But we walked along water. So we probably did eat some fish. Okay. But that fish we must have eaten when we ran out of fruits because fish also smells. Some of the fish, which is in fresh water, it is not as harmful. Salmon comes to mind. Salmon is not as harmful. Okay, so 
we'll, we'll go to slides and see this. This is whole versus process. So when you eat butta, butta is whole food, that is corn on the cob. It's good, body loves it. You say corn soup, frozen corn ka packet la ke soup and all that is also not processed. All they have done is remove the corn and freeze it. Corn meal is also uh, whole food. Corn flour is whole food. You have ground it into flour, but you have not removed anything. Corn starch is whole food. Popcorn is also whole food. The whole food. Corn has pop, that's all. You have not removed anything. But corn flakes is processed food. A lot of things have been added, chemicals have been added, they have rolled it and all kinds of things. Okay. Rolling in itself is not bad, but they have done different compositions. It is no longer corn, it is a different product altogether. Corn oil is even worse. You have removed all the fiber <coughs> and oil is left. And then there is something called high fructose corn syrup. This is what they make sugar syrup from corn. It is added to all Coca-Cola, soft drinks, a lot of food. That is what they ate. They add. It is the cheapest form of sugar. And it is the most harmful. They change the composition in this. Because normally corn syrup is not very sweet. So they change the composition through chemical processes. And this is what we are eating a lot of it. All the packaged food you will see will have, they call it HFCS. Okay. So, you know, a lot of people have this confusion. If it is plant-based, it must be good. People are asking, what do you think of CVI? It is plant-based. The sugar cane is plant-based. So what do you think of sugar? Sugar, sugar is plant-based food. The white sugar that you eat is plant-based food. Then you say, no, no, I'm going to have CVI. CVI is plant-based. What nonsense. I and mean, it's very harmful. So in fact, see, stevia is more harmful than sugar. And it's a separate talk, but okay. So you understood this point. Let's go to next. This is a normal Indian's daily meal plan. We get up 7 o'clock or whatever, and we have tea, which is made with milk and sugar. We eat a couple of rusk or, or biscuits. So you, I want to show this to you to tell you that there are Three things in this which are very harmful, ghee or oil, has no fiber, I told you, it's processed food, refined food. So it shows you when it goes to the stomach, your, your bacteria will not get any food. Second is sugar, sugar has no fiber. Third is dairy. Dairy also, milk and yogurt has no fiber. So together, these three things constitute between 20 and 10, 30 percent and 70 percent, anywhere from one third to two third of your daily meat has no fiber. That is what you are eating. A typical Indian vegetarian is eating from one third to two third of their daily food, caloric food, which has no fiber. So obviously you will develop those problems. Now let us say you ate you have a breach, you have a leaky gut, and you ate uh, sausages. Hmm? Now what do they do when they make these sausages? They See, they sell expensive meat as muscle meat. You can see the leg, you can see the thigh, chicken leg, chicken thigh, uh, or lamb's leg and thigh. You know. But when it comes to other parts, their eyes, their ears, their testicles, they just mash it up and put it inside the sausage. Now, if you're eating a goat or a beef or lamb, they also have thyroid glands. So that thyroid gland meat is somewhere in that sausage or in that hot dog you eat. And you already have leaky gut. So when that thyroid meat, a protein goes, and gets into that leaky gut, in your blood you have goat's thyroid or cow's thyroid, little bit of protein. So your body will develop antibodies for that to attack it. Now your thyroid must also is very similar in its structure, so your thyroid protein is also similar. So it starts attacking your thyroid also. That's the cause of thyroid problem, which so many people are getting, because somehow it, 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 it got leaked in. Now if you eat a fish, Fish doesn't have thyroid gland, or if you're eating a cabbage, cabbage doesn't have thyroid gland. So even if the protein in cabbage gets transferred, 
it looks very different than your body's two million proteins. Cabbage is a vegetable or apple. So if the protein from apple leaks in, it's not going to cause any problem. Please understand. It is only those proteins which match one of your two million proteins in your body. They will cause problems. Okay, so then we have breakfast again, alu paratha with dahi, poha, upma, idli, whatever. Have some dahi ki lassi or lemonade. At least when I was growing up, that's the, one of the two things we had for six, eight summer months. So dahi lassi, get again sugar, sugar in lemonade, sugar in this, and, and uh, dairy. Lunch again, dal, sabji, raita, the dairy has come in, rice and some mithai. Sugar is coming. Sugar, dairy, both are coming in. And oil is coming in. Oil is there in dal. Oil is there in sabji. Even on, you put ghee on top of roti also. Evening snack, samosa has oil. Tea has sugar and, and milk. Or if you have sherbet, 8 o'clock snack, same thing. With their drinks, they have some fried cashew or so oil comes in. Or they'll have a uh, chicken tikka kebab or whatever, you know. The point is that throughout the day, and this is the average person, healthy, healthy family. I'm not talking those children who drink three, four cokes every day. I mean, they are very bad. They, they have more than 70 percent, 50 plus 20, 70. Okay. So this is what we are eating. And we are talking about replacing this 50 to 70 percent with a food like green juice that you had outside. If you can replace it with that juice, that juice is full of fiber. All nutrients, so the change will happen. Of all the changes I'm going to talk about, that one change alone is most important. Okay, this is for a typical, we call it plant-based whole food. That's a different. A lot of people come to me and say, I'm vegetarian. Doesn't matter if you're vegetarian. Some say I'm vegan for five years. Vegans die at the same rate as vegetarians and vegetarians die at the same rate as non-vegetarians. Please understand, most of people will not know that. A lot of people then say socially, oh, I have turned vegan. Doesn't mean anything. Eating potato chips and drinking Coke is a vegan diet. Okay? But as we turn from become from a non-vegetarian to vegetarian, our dairy consumption increases, our butter and oil consumption and sugar consumption increases. And as we go from being vegetarian to vegan, the oil increases even more and sugar increases even more. So they all are harmful. So, so don't derive any comfort by saying that I have become vegetarian. Okay, so it just shows that for a typical person, and that's what I did, I took. So what I recommend is of the five food groups, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, grains and dal and legume. Try to consume equal amount of calories from all four. Rule of thumb. You can change it, but equal. So 400 calories, 400, 400, total 2,000 calories. You can change it from day to day. It doesn't matter. One day, eat more potatoes. The second day, have more cashews. doesn't matter. Okay. So here I took a sample of fruits. So apples and strawberries, these are fruits. And then these are Potatoes are starchy vegetable. This is your green vegetable. And then this is dal and legume. So one dal, one legume, one rice, wheat, and walnut and flaxseed. This is total 2,000 calories. You get about 82 grams of fiber. That's a very healthy diet. In US, they recommend that you get at least 25 grams of fiber. If you eat like this, you'll get 82. And your body will love it. You'll go to the toilet twice a day, not one. Nobody will have constipation problem. Once people change to it, they stop telling constipation. In fact, people say, I go to the bathroom three times. That's fine. Our body was designed that way. After every meal, you go to the bathroom. It's okay. Nothing wrong with it. Okay. And you poop a lot. You can weigh, weigh yourself. You know, you weigh before sitting on the toilet and then weigh yourself after. You know how much you poop. This is uh, fiber, and here is your um, how much protein? You are getting 58.5 grams. That is almost 11% of, of, of total, because times 4, 
tank pool will become about 230 or so, and of 2000, 230 are there, they 11.5 percent. And how much we said earlier, you need 6 percent. So you're eating twice the protein. Everything has protein. People don't understand the spinach. Okay, is this has a 30 percent protein in the spinach? Everything is protein. People say, no, no, I eat dal for protein. It's nonsense to say that I eat this food for protein and this food for sugar and this food for uh, fat. It doesn't work that way. There's more fat in chickpeas. That's why they make hummus out of it. Okay. All right. There's another concept we call caloric density. How many calories are there in per pound of food? Your body likes to get certain amount of volume because your stomach should feel full. When you have enough food, your stomach muscles stretch and say, I'm satisfied, I'm full. Okay. So, green leafy vegetables are the most uh, least rich in calories, only 100 calories. This is per pound, per pound. Fruits have 300, rice 500, dal 500, fresh and lean meats, chicken and all 800 calories a pound. Baked bread, 1300, because you are adding fat to it to make bread. Dry fruit, 1300, because water has been removed. Cheese and paneer, 1500. A lot of people in India have started eating it. Cheese and paneer. When I was growing up, we ate paneer maybe once a month when we attended somebody's wedding. We did not eat paneer at home. Now you go to any anybody's house, all they serve is only paneer. Only dal will be without paneer. There will be paneer matal, paneer saag, paneer this, shahi tikka paneer for appetizer. All things, and it's the worst thing. The worst thing. But they make it tasty. You see, paneer by itself is not tasty. You sometimes go and get fresh paneer and try to eat it. It has no taste. You can't eat it without salt. You eat a khira, it has a taste to it. A kakari has a taste to it. You eat apple, it has a taste to it. You like it. Paneer has no taste. In fact, I remember in our home, we, meat was not allowed in the, in the kitchen. So when my dad would make meat, he'll have to light a fire outside in the backyard. And they'll put lots of onions and lots of tomato. When you make normally jeera alu, you put a little bit of jeera and only alu, it tastes great. But to make that chicken, because they're so untasty, just tasty, you have to mix lots of onions and lots of tomatoes and lots of things to make it tasty. Why eat it? It's not right for you. All right, so this is a calorie and, and, and highest is of course butter and, and ghee, 3,500 calories. You can eat uh, one pound of ghee and it won't even fill your stomach, you will still feel hungry. And that's what we are doing, we are eating more. Those people who are overweight in their diet somehow these foods are there, they like these foods, they may not accept it or acknowledge it, but they are eating foods which are rich in oil. Okay, this is nutrient density food. Now this is per, per calorie, per calorie or per hundred calorie, any unit, how much nutrients are coming. And there is a table made by Dr. Uh, Dr. Schubert. Uh, yeah, it's called Nutrient Density Index, and nutrient NDI. So K is at the top, 1,000, varies from 1,000 to 0, 1. Coca-Cola has 1. Potato chips have 2. So I told you the diet of Coca-Cola with potato chips, which a lot of kids take these days, have no nutrients in them. And if you eat kale, in the juice that you were making outside, I, mean, I don't know what he made, but they are 1,000, 1,000. Spinach, 707. Carrots, 458. Other greens are here. So all greens are most nutrient rich. Shalgam ke patte, beetroot ke patte. Okay. So you want to be consuming those and getting rid of Coca-Cola and potato chips and ice cream. That is what we are talking about. It's very simple. By evening when you go, you say, oh my goodness, this thing is so simple. Why didn't I think of it before? Very simple. Get rid of food which has no nutrient value, mostly caloric value, and replace it with food which has low caloric value and mostly nutrient value. Okay, so I have a video I will play. How do I get it now? Let's see.
what do we have to eat? Whole grains, legumes, lentils, vegetables, and fruit, you've all familiar and heard about this. No oil, fish, fowl, meat, or dairy. No oil. No oil. <laughs> Let's just take a moment here because some people still are not clear about the fact, no oil. <laughs> Why? Why? Because the data. Olive oil is terribly seductive. Scott Gundy did some studies that are very short term that showed that it increases your good cholesterol, lowers your bad cholesterol, <coughs> improves your ratio. It got a huge amount of press. Doctors heard about it, and therefore it must be wonderful, right? Wrong. Because you look at longer term studies, Blankenhorn, right in the California. Two groups of patients, one saturated fat, the other monounsaturated like olive oil. The, Baseline angiogram at the end of the year, the angiogram disease of coronary disease had progressed just as much in each group. <clears throat> Lawrence Rudell on the research triangle took the African green monkey, some similar lipid metabolism to man, saturated, unsaturated, five years. In the monounsaturated olive oil group, higher HDL, lower LDL, better ratio, autopsy, just as much coronary disease. The oil companies didn't like that, so Lawrence Riddell repeated the study with rodents, and the result, the same. Dr. Vogel has gone on and shown us indeed that olive oil activates clotting factor seven just as much as butter. And Vogel, in a separate study, and Ong, in a separate study, have shown how it impairs flow-mediated dilatation that I just talked to you about, the brachiolar tunica test. And last month, in the journal, uh, the journal of the, of, the, of the National Cancer Institute, uh, olive oil, along with meat and dairy, is implicated in uh, a risk factor for uh, breast cancer. Well, that wasn't quite enough because I do get the Harvard Heart Letter. And I have great respect for Thomas Lee, who's the editor. But one of those heart letters said, for heart patients, be sure you use the heart healthy oils. <coughs> Canola oil, olive oil. So I wrote to Dr. Lee. I said, dear, dear Dr. Lee, I have, I have always had the highest regard for your Harvard Heart uh, letter, but I was puzzled and skeptical by your recommendation for oils for patients with heart disease. And I enclose for your review uh, these six articles and references that I'm aware of that <clears throat> suggest that this is not a good idea, and I also enclosed for you a copy of my study. And six months later, <clears throat> I got a letter back from Dr. Lee, dear Dr. Esselson, thank you for your reprints and your study. Uh, I would agree with you that as we move forward in this most complex of diseases, that we should remain flexible. <laughs> no oil. <laughs> What do we have to meet? All right, so that is Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. He is in the documentary, uh, Folks Over Knives, and he was with Cleveland Heart Clinic. Cleveland Heart Clinic is the most respected heart clinic in the world. On matters of heart, they are even uh, more important than uh, Mayo Clinic. And he said it very clearly, no oil. So that's what we talk about, no oil. And, and, and similarly, no sugar. Uh, OK, so this slide is now next one, how much to eat. So I recommend, because it's difficult when people 
Sometimes they talk about serving as they have two serving or four serving. But the serving is confusing. People don't understand. Now if you are a couple like Jayab Hadri and Amitabh Bachchan, they obviously both shouldn't eat the same amount. If, if Jayab Hadri is eating two serving, then Amitabh Bachchan needs to eat three or four serving. So it's a confusing, so I simplified it to weight. It becomes easy, you can relate to it. And so 1% of your body weight in fruits, which must include berries. Okay. Strawberry and, and blueberry, blackberry. In India, you get shatut. Shatut is a berry, it's very good. And you get jamun, you get palsa. So these are the kind of things um, you may get more here. You should consume them. They are very healthy for you, okay? Uh, minimum 1% of your body weight in vegetables, at least half in green leafy vegetables. So half can be starchy vegetables, potatoes and sweet potatoes or arbi, you know, guinea as we call it, taro root. But the other half should be green leafy vegetables or salad vegetables. Now green leafy vegetables are difficult to eat if you weigh 160 pounds, then 800 grams you need um, if, 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 let's say, in, 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 if you weigh 80 kilo, you need 800 grams of vegetable, 400 grams in potatoes or other starchy vegetables, 400 grams in green leafy vegetables. It's not easy to eat 400 grams of green leafy vegetables. You'll keep chewing for a long time. So juicing makes it easy. You go to office, you take a thermos glass full of the juice, you take it out, you eat, drink it, nobody bothers if you have less than 50 other people working. And here you should take out a whole bag because you know 400 grams of spinach will be about that much. And you start eating, they'll look at you, what are you doing, you know? Mm -hmm. So juicing just makes it easy. Juicing is only the second best option, but it's a very practical option. Otherwise you will in theory say, no, no, I will eat, I will eat, and you will end. After a week it will become very difficult. Now, Dr. Caldwell Assistant, whom you just saw, he treats Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton president of the richest country in the world, the largest economy. Four years after he leaves office, he has quadruple bypass. <coughs> quadruple? Four. 2004. 2008, they put two stents. 2010, they wanted to do another double bypass. His friend, who is a professor and doctor in University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Dean Ornish, told him, Bill, don't do the bypass. This is Dean Ornish telling Bill Clinton, don't do bypass, please understand all of you, if any of you have an uncle or an aunt or who is being debating whether they should do bypass or not. Bypass does not do anything. <coughs> does not do anything. In fact, Dr. B. M. Hegde, who is one of the doc Indian doctors I follow, he says it very clearly. When you have blockages, you develop natural bypasses. You know, my dad, I was here uh, on business trip in two, 1998, he was 83 and he collapsed in the morning. I had gone <laughs> out for business meetings. When I came back, they said he had collapsed. We have taken him to Apollo Hospital. And the Apollo Hospital doctor then showed me and said, sir, he has three blockages, 97%, 99%, 94%. <laughs> I'm talking 20 years ago, 24 years ago. So I said, you advise? You know, we have to have a bypass surgery. I said, yes. And bypass surgery was done. Then he was brought from emergency room or intensive care to the ward. But he could not build the strength to breathe. They ask you to do an exercise. You have to suck the air and make the ball up. And his condition deteriorated, went back to ICU, got back. ICU, they hyperventilate you. One month I was there. And that because they had done everything, they said, he can't do any more. Aap inko ghar le jaiye, ghar ka environment inko fayda karega. In that condition, ghar le jaiye. Every three, two days, he's going to ICU. Because they had made the money. They needed to make. Now this patient was not useless, useful for them. They wanted their room empty, the bed empty. We had to tell them, listen, yaan ghar nahi hai. All children are outside. I'm living in San Francisco. My sister is in... Uh, in Bonn, Germany. And anyway, so he did not come out of that hospital alive, the point I'm saying. If I knew then what I know now, he would not have faced that problem. The, the juice that you had 
is the best solution. Three times a day, a glass before every meal, your arteries begin to open up. And the thing is, the day, morning, till that morning, he was functioning fine. So they're natural bypasses. If any of you are facing bypass situation, please watch Dr. B. M. Hegde, Padam Bhushan. He talks about it, okay? Go to YouTube, type Dr. B. M. Hegde, you will see his videos. We need to eat flax seed or chia seed or walnuts because this has omega-3. Omega-3 is very important. We don't get it in our food. We only get it on these things. Mustard oil has omega-3. Okay, mustard, sarsong ka saag is good for omega-3. And sarsong grows wild. The God has given sarsong in plenty. If you go to in March, April, all the fields are full of sarsong. Even the wild lands are full. So nature provided in plenty what we need the most. You make juice out of sarsong. Problem with saag is that you have to put oil. We don't know how to make sarsong ka saag without oil. In fact, the story with sarsong ka saag is that every time you heat it, you add more oil in butter. Every time you re reheat it, put one more chamas ghee into it. So juicing makes it easy. Juicing is the only second best solution, but it's a very practical solution. You must take vitamin B12 supplement because B12 was found in river water, hand pump water. This is, it's a, it's, it's, it's in, when water is in contact with soil, you get B12. When we used to walk bare hand, bare feet, uh, and worked in the fields bare hand, you know, agriculture, then that vitamin B12 was getting absorbed, okay. But now it does not. So you have to take supplement. That's the only supplement you should take, no other supplement. Okay. Also, you need to get some sunshine and and you need to get out in the sun. I didn't mention it in here, but so people who are otherwise healthy, they are not on any medications. I allow two teaspoons of, of ghee or mustard oil. Mustard oil is the least harmful of all oils because it has a healthy omega-3 in it. And uh, eat as much as you feel like. Portion control is not needed, does not work. These things that you read in social media, there's a a social media post going around and say that you take your heart, I mean your stomach, split it into four sections. Have two sections worth of food, one fourth water and one fourth empty. You might have seen that, it's a big, big, it is from a Sanskrit verse. The thing there is, your heart does not have any air. Heart is muscles, it squeezes. As you start eating, it begins to expand. So there's no air in the heart. And then you should not drink water while eating anyway. So you eat your food and, and you eat as much as you feel like. Your body will give signals, sensitize your body. What do you want to say? I've had enough, don't give me any more. When the food is plant-based whole food, body will give you the signal. When the food is processed food, it will not. Processed food is designed by PhDs in psychology. It's designed so that you will eat more. When a doctor tells you it's your problem that you are eating too much and exercising enough, it is not your problem. You are eating too much because your satiation mechanism has been bypassed by a PhD who designed that food. There is a food called Pringle, chips. They advertise, you can't just have only one. You open the box, have one chip, you will keep eating till whatever movie you are watching. When it becomes empty, then you have to decide if you send up a kolu, can you kolu. You eat chips made at home, you can satiate it. Our body was designed that way, to get satiated. Nobody should have to tell you how much you eat. Your body will tell you. This is all nonsense. You need to go to a dietitian, and a dietitian has to tell you. I told you, we all are different. Everybody in this room is different. How can a dietitian tell you the same thing to everybody? Only you know. Any food that doesn't suit you, don't eat it. If you think that when I eat the food, then my stomach will get loose. Don't eat the food. Don't eat the food. Eat it. The doctor has said that the food is not good. There are so many choices. Eat anything. 
all fruits are good. The second problem I see is the, the, um, this is better than this. It's all nonsense. You know, if you're eating one thing every day, then changing it to something else will be good for you. Because let's say wheat, uh, atta, wheat ka atta, has A, B, C nutrients. And, and you have eaten wheat all along, so your body will be ABC. To hoga. XYZ will not be. It turns out that in millet there is XYZ. If you have eaten in your 50 years of life, and you have eaten a millet, then you will have a benefit. But the other person who is eating millet for 50 years, he should not eat millet, he should eat a little bit. So you need to eat a variety. And what I suggest as a rule of thumb, you have 7 days. So at least eat seven fruits every week, eat seven vegetables every week, eat seven nuts every week. Jo aapka favorite hai, wo aap sab se yadat khalo, koi problem hai. Saat din mein lunch, breakfast, lunch, dinner, 21 meals are there. Out of 21, 11 meals, eat your favorite. If your favorite is rice, eat rice 11 meals. Remaining 10 meals, sometimes have chapati, sometimes have quinoa, sometimes have oatmeal, sometimes have millet. They are good for you. Have a eat a variety. Always eat a variety. Okay, variety. But you can eat whatever you like and as much as you like. No restriction. Only restriction is, I'll come to that, that you eat it during daytime. So I talked about circadian rhythm. You have to eat it during daytime. Eat everything you like and some that you don't. Variety is important. So eat something that you may not like so much, but some things. All right. How much to eat? How to eat? Eat fresh fruits, raw, uncooked, and without juicing. Don't juice fruits. Fruits should be eaten whole. Eat green leafy and other salad vegetables, uncooked whenever possible. Green juice, raw leafy and salad vegetables, what you had today was a raw vegetable juice, eat flaxseed ground, otherwise it goes through your tummy and does not get absorbed. Eat dal, legumes dal, sprouted or cooked. Even when you have sprouted it, it is a good idea to blanch it in hot water for one minute or something. It becomes more tasty. You, know? you can make dal out of uh, sprouted uh, moon. It tastes very good and you don't need ghee for it. You make a sprouted moon as a dal and have just the right amount. Good quality hing is important. See, If you have good quality hing, you will not miss the ghee in it. It tastes great. Okay, eat grains cooked. Obviously roti and other things, you have to cook them. When to eat? You must eat in a narrow eating window of 8 to 10 hours. And it should be in the daytime. In uh, Jain people, they have a concept which is called Cha Vihar. They suggest that you should have your first meal 48 minutes after sunrise. And you should have your last meal 48 minutes before sunset. Now sunrise, sunset is about 12 hours. You take one and a half hour, you left it ten and a half. So as per them, ten and a half hours. There's a, there's a reason for that. I will see if we have time, we'll cover that reason, why it is important. Earlier the eating window, the better it is. Okay, so, but dinner must be finished before it is dark outside and three hours before your bedtime. Finish last meal dinner at least three hours before bedtime. Okay, these are my guidelines. You can take a picture. All, all the dietary and lifestyle guidelines are in this picture. It has a second page to it. This is page two. So besides food, I have covered lifestyle also. We will discuss those as we go along. Uh, 
Fasting will come to fasting. We'll discuss that. Previous page. Previous page. Yes, you want? Okay. Shall I move on? All right. So, um, so we discussed that no animal food, no eggs, no dairy, no refined processed food, no oil, sugar. Eat from all five groups. Herbs and spices are very important. Sometimes people come and tell me, you know, they fall sick. No, I'm having boiled food. Why are you having boiled food? The spice is not the problem. Oil is the problem. Add all the spices, it's not good. People fall sick and say, I'm going to have boiled food. That makes no sense. I mean, they stop eating spices. Spices are what going to heal you. Spices are most important. But don't make those spices in ghee. So avoid ghee, but not the spices. These are the only three ingredients you need to watch. Omega-3, vitamin B12, you need supplement. For D3, you need to go out in the sunshine. 15 20 minute road, make sure that you go sit in the sun. Longer the better, half an hour, 45 minutes, that'll be good. And keep your body hydrated, drink half a liter or two glasses warm water, first thing before you brushing teeth. And then one glass after every <laughs> meal, 45 minutes after every meal. And then one glass before going to bed. Practice intermittent fasting, 16 hour fasting, 8 hour eating window. That 8 hour can be from 10 to 6. Breakfast at 10 o'clock, dinner finished dinner by 6 o'clock. Now you need to reduce it slowly. People eat from 7 in the morning till 11 at night. 7 o'clock bed tea, we talked about, we showed in the chart. And then 11 o'clock a glass of milk before going to bed. So you have 16 hours of eating window. Very bad. Very bad for diabetes, causes diabetes actually. That is the cause of diabetes. Okay. And uh, so you reduce it. Morning tea, try to get rid of it if possible. And milk, you stop from tomorrow. If you, any of you are taking that milk before bedtime, just <coughs> today is the last day, don't even have it now. So that makes some improvement. Now your window reduces to, let's say you finish dinner at nine and you skip your delay. So now breakfast at nine and dinner at nine. You must finish by nine. So that's 12 hours. What a good improvement. Then by next week, you improve more. Bring dinner early to eight o'clock. So by, by end of next 30 days, you will be down to eight to 10 hours. 10 hours is also okay. Eight hours for those who have diabetes. The lesser, the better. A lot of many spiritual masters take only one meal a day. That means their gap is 23 hours. In one hour, they consume all the food. For 23 hours, don't, don't eat any food. You go to Uttar Kashi and, and Rishikesh, you'll find many spiritual masters follow that. It's very healthy. It's called OMAD, one meal a day. It's the best diet. Okay. So keep a Kadashi fast, which is every two weeks. You skip one full day and then eat the day after next normal breakfast. Or two nine day OMAD fast, one meal a day, which is your Navratri fast. Okay, Navratri is gonna start on 26th. So 26th to 4th, just have only one meal a day. That'll be very good for you. Stay active, walk 10,000 steps daily. Keep your circadian, circadian clock in sync. Sleep a minimum of seven to nine hours. Love your family and friends unconditionally. Stay connected and pray regularly and have a positive attitude, full of gratitude. That you pray is important. Who you pray to is irrelevant. Okay. Prayer with gratitude releases certain hormones in you, which are very good for your health. But you must have the sense of gratitude. You know, you know, no, 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 we are meeting a little down on it. We don't talk. Sit down in a quiet place and think of, we have a concept among Hindus called Isht Devta, your favorite God. If you have one, pray to him. If you don't have one, you have a basketball coach in your high school that you had a lot of respect for him, think of him. Or your grandfather is the one that you were the closest to, think of him. And the tears should roll down your eyes. The gratitude has to be there. That is what doing the improvement to your health. Eat 
eat everything you like and some that you don't, eat as much as you like, and there is really no other restriction. The American Egg Board is a promotional marketing board appointed by the U.S. government, whose mission is to increase demand for egg and egg products on behalf of U.S. egg producers. Now, if an individual egg company wants to run an ad campaign, they can say whatever they want. But if an egg corporation wants to dip into the $10 million the American Egg Board sets aside for advertising, because the board is overseen by the federal government, corporations are not allowed to lie with those funds. What a concept. Which leads to quite revealing exchanges between egg corporations that want to use that money and USDA on what egg companies can and cannot say about eggs. Thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, I was able to get my hands on some of those emails. Of course, a lot of what I got looked like this. Please note a number of items about our Salmonella Crisis Module. Any questions? Or even better, entire sheets of paper that literally just said this. That was the whole sheet of paper. Our tax dollars hard at work. But check this out. This is some egg company trying to put out a brochure on healthy snacking for kids. But because of existing laws against false and misleading advertising, the head of USDA's poultry research and promotion programs reminds them that you can't couch eggs or egg products as being healthy or nutritious. Uh, see the words nutritious and healthy carry certain connotations. You know that food is actually good for you. Uh, but because eggs have the amount of cholesterol they do, plus all the saturated fat, the, the words healthy and nutritious are problematic when it comes to eggs. This is the USDA saying this. However, the USDA helpfully suggests you can say eggs are nutrient dense. Wait a second, why can you say eggs are nutrient dense but not nutritious? Because there's no legal definition of nutrient dense. Uh, you can say Twinkies and Coca Cola are nutrient dense, but legally, you can't say something is nutritious unless it's actually nutritious. So, for example, the egg industry wanted to run this ad calling eggs a nutritional powerhouse that aids in weight loss. The USA had to remind the industry you can't portray eggs as a diet food because of the fat and cholesterol content. In fact, they have nearly twice the calories of anything that can be called low calorie. Nutri nutritional powerhouse can't be used either. Fine, the industry said, they'll move to plan B. Headline, the ad, exceptional nutrition. Nope, because again, given the saturated fat and cholesterol, you can't legally call eggs nutritious. So, the ad ended up falling to satisfaction, and instead of weight loss, they had to go with, can reduce hunger. USDA congratulated them on their cleverness. Yes, a food that when eaten can reduce hunger. What a concept. You can't even call eggs a food relatively low in calories. Can't say eggs are low in saturated fat. They're not. Can't say they're relatively low in fat. Can't even call them a rich source of protein because they're not. It's illegal to advertise that eggs pack a nutritional wallop. Can't truthfully say that. Or have a high nutritional content. You can't say eggs are nutritious at all. Can't say nutritious. Cannot say eggs are nutritious. Sometimes you have to tell the industry a few times. Eggs have so much cholesterol, you can't even say they contribute nutritionally. Can't say eggs are healthful. Certainly can't say they're healthy. Um, have you seen how much cholesterol there are in those things? Can't say healthy. Can't even say eggs contribute healthful components. Since you can't say eggs are a healthy start to the day, the USDA suggests satisfying start. Can't say, can't call eggs a healthful ingredient, but you can call eggs a recognizable ingredient. Can't truthfully say eggs are good for you, can't say they're good for you. By law, the egg industry needs to steer clear of words like healthy or nutritious. For food to be labeled healthy under FDA rules, it has to be low in saturated fat. Eggs fail that test. 
and less than 90 milligrams of cholesterol per serving. Even half an egg fails that criteria.